Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's class. We're doing Getting Started with Computers and Devices. Carol Ann will be teaching the class. She is here with us through a grant called Guiding Ohio Online that is made available to us by the State Library, and it allows us to keep offering these awesome programs to you all. There'll be an evaluation after the class that will be sent to you via email. If you can fill that out for us, it really helps us with being able to report to that grant, how things are going, and the, the type of programs we're offering through that grant. My name is Missy Latell. I'm the Customer Experience Manager here at the Cuyahoga Falls Library, and I will be acting as co-host today. So if you have questions as we're going along, put them in the chat, and we're going to hold off on answering those until after the presentation, but I'll be keeping an eye on those and relaying those to Carol Ann once we're done. Also, if you have any more questions, like you'd like to delve a little deeper into any of this, she offers a Tech Tuesday on um, well, obviously Tuesdays from one to seven. You can do uh, walk-up times, you can call in and set a specific time. What time are your walk-up times, Carol Ann? That is actually in the presentation. So I'll go Excellent. over that in a little bit. Okay, so if you want any more information on any of this, she can actually sit with you one-on-one. -on -one and offer that. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to her and she will do our presentation we're gonna record. Awesome, thank you so much, Missy. And like she said, uh, we will have the opportunity to ask questions later. So definitely keep them in mind. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start by sharing my screen. So like Missy said, this is our getting started with computers and devices. And with this class, I wanted something that was going to be a little more overarching and uh, accessible for a variety of software and devices. So I was trying to distill down what uh, is something that people can really benefit from. As a part of this class, as you know, we are recording it. And this will be available on YouTube, as well as handouts that will be emailed with the link for the recording. Uh, those handouts are gonna have other links to other resources, as well as the information that is gonna be in this uh, presentation. So keep an eye out for those. Those should be coming possibly tomorrow, uh, provided we don't have any technical difficulties. If for whatever reason you need a printed handout, you can certainly come to the library and request one to be printed out for you. That way, if maybe you don't have a computer with internet at home to look at those things, you can still have a hard copy if that is necessary for you. All right. So like what Missy was talking about, we have Tech Tuesday. And Tech Tuesday is a one-on-one -on -one time with me where I go over any sort of device or software or answer questions and kind of be that person to help you out with whatever steps you're taking. We also have a variety of different equipment in our maker space here at the Cuyahoga Falls Library. And so I can certainly teach you how to use any of that equipment as well. So I have a nice wide range of ways that I can help you. And like she said, those are every Tuesday. Uh, I do have walk-up times at 2 p.m. and at 7 p.m. So those are first come, first serve, because we found uh, the scheduled appointments were getting booked out for weeks in advance. So we wanted something where if you just had a question suddenly pop up, you have an opportunity to come in and work with me. Uh, I also have scheduled times between 3 and 6 p.m. So again, we have those one-hour time slots for you to use for that. So feel free if you have any questions for um, this presentation or others that we didn't get to and you want a little more specific answer, then I can certainly meet with you during those times. All right, so who is this class for? This class is really for people that are kind of just starting out or maybe they just have a little bit of experience. And also for people that want to maybe experiment more. Maybe you've just been going on the internet and checking your email, but you keep hearing about these other cool apps and podcasts and things and don't know how to get to them. So I want to show you how to kind of experiment. And really, it's for people who want to be more like a kid. And 
I'm gonna go into what that means exactly. So despite popular belief, kids are not born knowing how to use technology and devices and computers. Like this is not an innate skill set that, that this next generation has uh, been coming out of the womb with. I assure you it is not. But here are the things that kids are doing a little differently than adults. Kids are really great at learning new languages when they're younger. And really, that's what a lot of the technology and stuff that we're doing is. It's a totally new language. And children are also very curious and they try things. They're not afraid to try. They'll bat it at um, different things and, and press buttons and try and discover what's behind uh, things that move. Um, they also learn from friends and family. How often do you see a small child trying to do something an adult or another child will help them accomplish what they're trying to do? And really, these kids are also learning a lot of these skills and experiences and vocabulary in schools. So they're taking full classes with teachers explaining step by step on how to use these devices and then they're coming home with that knowledge from school as well. That, and they also have fun with it. They don't let like that anxiety and stress kind of overrun them uh, at times. They find ways of having fun with these technology uh, and software and devices. So our big goal is to be a little bit more like a kid. So what we're going to cover in this class is kind of that concept of technology as a language. So I'm going to talk about the different frequent symbols in technology, and I'm going to talk about how we're communicating with our technology, either with a mouse or with our touching, and what do our touches actually mean when we're swiping or pressing for a certain number of times or how long we're pressing. And I also want to show you how to find more information, how to get more specific answers for whatever device or software you're working with. So it's kind of a big overarching something that you might be able to pick up for really anything that you're working with. Okay. Now, here's something that's interesting. These two things have a lot more in common than you might realize because icons and these symbols function a lot like hieroglyphics. Each of those symbols mean something. And as we learn how to decode that meaning, then we can really learn how to use our tablet a little better. Okay, let's keep going. So a lot of the software and devices give you clues on how to learn these different symbols. If you touch it, it might expand another menu, like this uh, Windows menu. You'll see the different symbols, but then as you touch it, you have the explanations of what those symbols mean. So it's sort of like your key to understanding them. And a lot of these are very common symbols. You can also swipe and expand menus on tablets or smartphones and you'll see the explanations of these symbols being labeled. So definitely learn from clues that are right there on your device to figure out what these things mean. Because some symbols might be different or they might be pretty much the same. Another way if you're on a computer is that you can hover your mouse pointer over top of a symbol or a button and a lot of times it'll actually show you what it means. So it gives you a little pop-up. As long as you hold it still, it'll show you what that is labeled to do. Uh, and it works really well if there's the same symbol in multiple places because they might be doing different things. So use your mouse to hover over things. Okay. So I wanted to get into a handful of specific examples of what these symbols mean that might be handy for you to kind of experiment with and, and have in your vocabulary. 
the big one here, you'll see a lot of software and devices that have you go into the settings menu. And before, a lot of times it used to be fully labeled with the word settings, but as devices have gotten smaller and software more complex, we needed symbols that take up less space. And if you look across the screen here, we have a bunch of different styles of setting menus icons. Uh, so you can see the idea is pretty much the same. It's this gear shape and you'll see it in various places. But that settings menu gives you other options to turn on and off for your device. Maybe it's how long it stays on or Maybe you want to turn on some accessibility features or change the color of your background. Uh, that settings menu might be a clue for where you can go next to change and modify your device. Another common menu is actually a hamburger menu. And I really think these programmers were pretty hungry when they were developing the names for these. But this hamburger menu is typically three lines or three dots. And I know Google has their waffle menu, which is nine dots. And similar to our settings menu, this will either show more options that there isn't room for on the screen, or it might take you to another menu for things. Uh, some websites are using them as a little icon to hide their menu so it doesn't clutter the screen. So definitely try out those three dots if you're looking for a way to uh, change your experience or to uh, find features hidden on your device or software. Next, we have our drop down arrow. And the drop down arrow a lot of times will be next to maybe a word or another symbol. And that arrow means that there's other options. Maybe it's in a menu and it'll expand another menu that is longer. Um, sometimes it's a series of choices that you can pick one. Uh, sometimes it's like menus on for ordering food or for turning on certain features. Uh, so look for those drop down menus and they can also hide or reveal toolbars and other features in your software. So it can kind of shrink or enlarge your uh, viewing of a certain part of your app or your software. So play around with those down, uh, drop down arrows and you might discover some very interesting features. The next a uh, very common symbol is our magnifying glass. And you'll think of this as typically Sherlock Holmes peering through something to make it look larger. But just like Sherlock Holmes, you're searching for clues, you're searching for information. So whenever you see that magnifying glass, it's usually a button to get you to a search feature. Sometimes it's a search within maybe a chat window or a search for a website, or even searching our catalog here at the library, you'll often see that search is that magnifying glass. One difference is if you see a plus symbol or a minus symbol inside that magnifying glass, that means that you're trying to zoom in or zoom out so you can enlarge or shrink your view or maybe a certain element uh, on your software to be able to look at it differently. So know that they might mean two different things, but there's a little hint on the inside as to which one it might be. So that's very good to know. Now, here's another thing that sometimes those symbols don't always look the same, but they mean the same thing. Here's an example of Wi-Fi symbols. And depending on your device or software or computer or brand, your Wi-Fi symbol might look different, but they kind of have a general idea where it's this kind of pie shape and it's kind of those dot echo lines 
um, for sending a signal. They used to use it for like a little radio antenna um, or that pie shape shows you either a little bit or it's filled in more and more that shows the strength of that signal. But sometimes I know on my computer, I have a globe and that's because Wi-Fi connects us to the internet or the World Wide Web. That's why they're using a globe. So we might have to figure out, okay, what is our device's version of our Wi-Fi symbol on how we can connect or how strong our signal is. So you might have to learn different symbols for the exact same thing. Now I'm gonna go into our computer mouse because that's been sort of our gateway into a lot of this technology where we use a mouse on a computer in our software. And our mouse has our little pointer or our cursor. And the cursor is also giving you clues as to what you can interact with and how. So you've probably seen a lot of these different uh, cursor types with our little pointing finger, an arrow, or this little eye beam, or these uh, four directional arrows. These all mean something different when it's over top of something. So let's get into that. So for our cursor pointer, that typically shows where your mouse is on the screen. You can use it for selecting or opening things or clicking and dragging and moving things on your screen. Our little pointer hand is for something that is clickable that is a link typically to something on the internet or in another section of a file. So that might take you somewhere else. Now, if you see this little eye beam, that typically means that there's text either a empty box where you can type information in, or maybe there's text that you can copy, say on a website, and you can uh, be able to save that somewhere else. Now, you also have our directional arrows, and I have a couple of different options here where sometimes it's all four directions, and these are all for moving or resizing uh, different elements in your software or maybe on your window screen. Uh, if you see the double headed arrows at the edge of a window, that means that you can move the edge of that and change its size in that direction. If it's in a corner, that means that it can go in two directions instead of just one. All right. Now, after you click, you might see something different on your mouse tip. Uh, and this is your computer trying to convey to you, hey, something happened, something changed. And you'll see maybe it changes uh, and moves its shape. Maybe you're clicking and you see an hourglass or a spinning ball or these chasing dots. These all mean that your computer are thinking that it's working on whatever request you, you gave it. Uh, and it's best to just wait until that changes and stops so that it has time to process your request. Just like you don't want a little kid to ask you 10 questions at one time because nothing gets answered. You want one question and let it finish and then move on to the next thing. So we wanna be mindful of that conversation we're having with our computers and devices. Another handy one to note is your back arrow. Become best friends with your back arrow. Sometimes it's a back arrow on your device. Sometimes it's in your software or your app and it will take you back to the screen you are. Your back arrow is really great for practicing. You're like, how did I get here? Let me go back a few steps and try that again and practice that path through your different menus. Um, it can also mean undo. Maybe you type something in a document 
and you didn't really want to do that, or maybe you deleted something on accident. If you find that undo button, you can undo that delete without as much trouble. And there's also a forward arrow, but I am big fan of our back arrow. Okay, so those were all ways that our computers and devices are communicating to us in that language of symbols. Uh, but now we have to talk about how we're communicating with our technology. What are you saying when you're clicking or double clicking or touching or swiping? So we're gonna get into how we're communicating. Now your mouse is again, one way that's kind of where a lot of this technology started and where it's inspired future uh, kind of the physical language of communicating. But again, it's kind of like using sign language, but the language for our computers to understand how we interact with it. So again, we wanna look for our different symbols and our mouse pointers to see the different clues on what we're going to be interacting with and clicking. So here's a possible conversation. If your computer is showing you that little uh, internet link icon on your cursor and you use your left mouse button to click on it once, that means I would like to go to this website. Wherever this is going, I would like to go there. Now, the number of times you click and how fast you click are all things that communicate different things as well. So like for instance, in our text, if we click once, it is putting that little cursor right there in that spot and we can make and edit changes. When we click there twice and double click, that highlights that first word that our cursor is close to, just that one word. Maybe you want to copy it or search for its meaning. But if we triple click, it might highlight the whole line or like this, the whole passage of uh, that different piece of text. So the number of times we click can make a big difference in what we're communicating, uh, what we want from our, our computer. The next thing is how fast you click something can also make a big difference. If you do two slow clicks like here, it will signal to the computer, hey, I want to change the name of this file. I want to edit the text for this and call it something else. But if you click on it two times very quickly or double click, that will open the file. So that's a completely different message. Once you're changing the name, one is you're opening and interacting with that software or that file. So you have to be careful about learning what you're saying and how you're saying. it. The next big one is a drag and drop. So if I click with that left mouse button still and hold it down and drag it to another place and then let go, those are each three different things I'm saying to my computer. I'm saying, pick up this file, click. I'm holding it down, move this file somewhere else. And then when I let it go, this is where I want this file to be. I want you to move it from that other place over to this place. Maybe it's another folder, maybe it's just somewhere else on the screen. But each of those different parts are saying something different to your computer. Now, Many of us know that we have a right mouse button. So the right mouse button says something different as well. So if we see again, our little internet pointer, uh, we are telling the computer by right clicking just one time, I would like to see what is other ways of interacting with this information. Sometimes there's a menu. Sometimes you can right click and open in a new window, or you can right click and copy of a link or right click and save a picture. So that gives you other options for interacting with what you're seeing 
uh, underneath your mouse pointer. And the other thing to note is depending on what you right click on, you might get completely different menus. It's not always the same menu because you can be interacting with each of these different things in different ways. Maybe you're opening the file with another program. Maybe you're wanting to change your display settings by right clicking on your desktop. Maybe you want to open this computer link to uh, another website or another portion of the website. So that's why you might not see the same thing you might be expecting because you might be clicking in a different spot. So keep an eye on where you're right clicking with your mouse pointer and that right click button. The other big part of our mouse is our scroll wheel. And a scroll wheel is really handy. So again, we have our little internet pointer. And if I'm scrolling, maybe I'm scrolling over a website and paging down. Maybe I'm in a picture of a site or software and I can zoom in and out of that picture or that element. So that can work again in a couple of different ways depending on where your pointer is and how you can interact with the things below it. So our scroll wheel is very handy. And you also might wanna note sometimes they can be buttons too. So be careful whether or not you're moving the wheel or pressing it like a button. Now laptops, they have touch pads. You might ask me, well, Carolyn, they don't have scroll wheels. How do I scroll up and down? Uh, you can hold down your mouse button and grab that uh, scroll bar on the side, the little gray bar you often see, or touchpads actually use two finger scrolling, where you use two fingers on your pad to either move your screen up and down, or if it's zoomed in, you can move it side to side. And to zoom in, it's that pinching and spreading of your two fingers. So you can change the size of um, your screen if it's something that can change size and zoom in and out. And another little neat thing that I found uh, while working on this is that you can touch your touchpad once and that's typically with uh, one finger as kind of like a click like you would with a button. But if you use two fingers and touch it like you would click, that's actually a right click. Until I started filming this, I didn't actually know that you could right click with two fingers. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I'm still learning so much as I'm uh, going through all of these things all the time. So there's always opportunities to learn. Now with devices, again, we saw that kind of transition of our mouse with buttons to our touchpad where you can do a lot of the motions and clicking with just a surface. Now we're doing it with a device. And our devices have these touch screens. And for the most part, touch screens are going to be capacitive touch, which means that you need something that conducts electricity, like our skin. And so that's why maybe you're trying to use your fingernail to touch on something small but that's not gonna work because it's not conductive. So you might need to use a stylus if it's really small, which is a special pen that can work with your device. Or you have to make sure that you have a nice um, soft supple uh, skin on the tip of your finger or maybe the edge of your finger so that it makes good connection. So here's different ways that we can tap and touch on our devices. So just like our click, a single touch is like clicking and opening or activating a button. You're saying whatever I'm touching, if it's something that I can touch and open, it will open. If it's just an empty space, maybe it isn't gonna do anything. You might have not touched in quite the right place. The next thing is a how long you're touching. If it's a press and hold, 
you can see it opens other options or other menus, kind of like a right click. And you can also touch and hold and then move that icon, kind of like our click and drag, because your device doesn't have a button to hold down to kind of hold down the drag, click and drag. So you're staying, keeping your finger on the device and sliding, excuse me, around the screen to drag and drop different elements. So maybe your device isn't opening the app that you are expecting it to. Or maybe I know cameras have started to, if you press the shutter button and hold it, it'll take video instead of a, a camera uh, photograph. So knowing how long we're pressing is going to show us, oh, I'm communicating an entirely different message. Uh, when I touch it differently with how long or in what way. The other thing you can do is swiping where you're dragging your finger in different directions and there's up and down and side to side. And sometimes you can expand things more and more. Uh, I know Apple has even started dragging from the corners. Uh, so you might discover different options and menus and features if you swipe your devices in different directions, see what happens. The next one is if you have something that you want to zoom in and out. And just like our touchpad, you can spread your fingers to zoom in or pinch them down like you're zooming out. And it's kind of like if you're saying, oh, I want it to be really small, you're going to Bring your fingers real small. If you want it really big, you're going to spread those fingers out. So that's again that zooming up and down. Because of the swipe, we don't need two fingers to scroll like we would on the computer touchpad. But for this, you're using two fingers to spread and uh, pinch to zoom in and out. And as we have more features and devices, we need to learn new ways of communicating information. And just like our computer mouse has that uh, less well-known triple click, you can now use three fingers on certain devices. And this one, I'm using three fingers and tapping it two times to turn on and off this magnifier. It allows me to zoom in on little sections of my screen. So those three fingers tapping twice can turn on and off this feature that I've turned on. So not all devices will support this. And maybe the feature that uses that uh, communication isn't turned on. So you might have to go into your settings and your accessibility to turn on these features. Uh, but know that there are lots of different ways of communicating to our devices what we're wanting to do. And it's learning those, um, the meaning of what we're trying to tell our device. Because maybe you're sending it mixed messages. Maybe you're touching with too many fingers or too few fingers or not fast enough. But the big thing is notice that change. See what happens before and then after. Are we dealing with coffee beans and we need to find a grinder to turn them into ground coffee for our coffee maker? Are there steps in between? How do we get from point A to point B? What happens when I click on this? What happens when I hold my finger down and press longer? Um, what does the symbol do? Will it show me what it, what it means if I click on it? Or if I press the back button, will it take me somewhere else? So notice these changes as you're learning and experimenting. And just like that, we want to experiment. Try clicking on things. See what it does. Maybe you'll figure something out, a cool feature. Maybe you'll, just like I learned about the two-finger right-click menu, for our touchpad, you never know all these neat features that are getting added to uh, even some of our older devices that we might not have known. So definitely experiment with things. And then also 
practice. Practice, practice, just like any language. You're not going to hear a word once and then just automatically know how to use it all the time. Uh, you got to give yourself some time and space to figure things out and then use it. And if you don't use it very often, you will probably forget it. How many of us have learned a language or an instrument in school or a song? Uh, and if you haven't played it or used it in a long time, maybe you don't remember it as well anymore. So definitely keeping up on practice is gonna make a big difference when you're getting started. Okay, so maybe you're telling me, Carol Ann, I have experimented, I have practiced, I have looked in all of the things and I still don't know what's going on. And I really need to do this one thing or change this one feature. How do I do this? Where do I look? You are not alone. You're not alone in this world of there not being a printed manual with our devices anymore, or this update has changed the way everything looks and everything's in all new places, or um, they're doing things differently, or they don't sell that device or that software anymore. And so you need to learn something new and different. There are tons of people that if you are struggling with something, more than likely someone else has definitely struggled with it too. Or maybe somebody is just out there trying to help like we we're doing here at the library. So the first thing I wanna show you is basic searching tips for your software or your devices. Uh, you can go to your favorite search engine. I a lot of times use Google. Uh, you can put in your device's name or your software's name. It's really good to have as much information as possible. Like I have my Galaxy A11 uh, and you can look up basics or how to put another word with just the software name and your what you're trying to do. And a lot of times this is how you'll find the manual for your device or your software that you can then read through. And there's also people that will put up instructional videos, maybe it's through the software. Um, many devices also have help features that you can also search in and look for keywords. So use that device name and software along with terms like basic, how to, for beginners, tips, starter, setup, depending on what you're wanting to do. The other thing that I really like doing is that I'm a very visual learner. Sometimes the written out explanation of things just don't really make a lot of sense. So I will a lot of times look for videos of how to do something especially for software and devices, because maybe they're saying, yes, click on the settings menu, but maybe their settings menu looks different from the other settings menus I've seen. Maybe their little icon is different. Uh, so I will look up videos and you'll find, and Google does this as well as some other search engines, up at the top, there are different options for all sometimes images or shopping or videos, I click on that video section and it'll show me either YouTube videos or things from other uh, sites. Sometimes it's from the vendor's site where they have uh, instructions for their product specifically. If you don't see it up there, you might have to use that hamburger menu, those three dots that say more to find that video option. So if you're a visual learner like me, you might try learning through videos of people doing this. And sometimes those videos are from kind of everyday people like you and I that are sharing their frustrations and showing, hey, I figured this out. This is how you do this. And I don't see other people explaining it. Let me help. Or sometimes it's the company themselves saying, hey, we really want you to be comfortable with our product. Here's a place to learn about it. So check out those video searches. Now, maybe you've done kind of some basic searches or maybe your problem is really specific. Maybe try other words along with your software device. Make sure you're using the right version. Um, maybe you need to put in the date for 
something that's more recent because there's certain software that's been out for a long time and it's been through a lot of changes and might look really, really different. Or you can even write down the whole problem in maybe a sentence of saying, I can't get my phone to stop turning off. I can't get my Pixel 2 XL to stop turning off. Um, you can also kind of experiment with those different things and see what might give you more information. Read a few of the links, see if there's some terms that might um, help you make a better search. Uh, maybe you find out what the feature's called and you can learn how to turn that feature on and off. So adjust your search with different words, depending on what you're trying to do. And then the next part, maybe you've Googled it and maybe you just need help. Maybe you aren't sure of the jargon or the lingo or what, where to find your device label. Um, ask your friends and family. We also have our friendly library staff that can possibly help with some quicker things of, hey, where's this thing on my phone? I don't, wear, don't know where it is. Or you can do that hour long Tech Tuesday session with me if you really need to kind of sit down and go through things maybe a little more slowly or a little more specifically, maybe you need a little more time. Um, or sometimes there's also other community resources, other classes, other, um, departments that will help with your specific device or issue that uh, they might be experts in. So look for those different resources or maybe have the librarian help you find those other resources. And then as a part of the handout as well, I'm going to be including links to our other really great websites. There's sites that will teach some of the things that we went over today, like giving you practice on how to click or double click so you can practice the speed or clicking and dragging. Um, if maybe this class was a little too basic for you and you want to learn more in depth on specific software or certain things like that, definitely check out our LinkedIn Learning that is a feature that is offered through the Ohio Public Libraries where we're paying for a subscription as the state library. Uh, they offered this access to LinkedIn Learning, which used to be called lynda.com, where it's experts giving you video presentations. Their videos are broken down and there's practice files and it will go into all kinds of great information. Maybe it's for image editing or learning how to use Excel for finance or how to uh, prepare different files for resumes or cover letters. Um, they'll show very specific information on how to use some pretty in-depth software and tools. And I have found them to be very useful. And with it being free through the library, you just need an Ohio-based library card to access these resources. But you have to make sure that you're using the link to uh, LinkedIn Learning from the library card that you're using because it uh, is checking whether or not you have an Ohio-based library card. All right, so I know I covered a lot of information and like I said, we're going to be posting this on YouTube so you can watch this again and again as you like. And we will also have those handouts that will have a little more uh, in-depth information in them as well as a few links. But if you have questions now, I'd be more than happy to answer that you any that you might have. <laughs>